All right. Well, welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for joining our press conference with elected officials to protect America in New York. We're so grateful for all of our panelists um, and speakers today and all of the uh, press and audience members who are attending. We are here to talk about our letter launch of over 100 elected officials to protect uh, America and New York, supporting responsible offshore wind development. Um, my name is Dominic Brangillo. I'm the executive director and co-founder of Elected Officials to Protect America, council member in Caroline, New York for eight years and six years as deputy town supervisor. So we're here to talk about how, what the benefits are for offshore wind to New York and creating jobs leading America's transition to a clean energy economy and protecting New York State and our communities from the worst impacts of the climate crisis. And that's the letter that, that we'll be discussing that was launched today. And from every corner of the state, elected officials have signed on and, and really urged the responsible and supported responsible build out of offshore wind because New York State is in a unique position to benefit from offshore wind development from the Atlantic coast, Long Island, New York City, the Hudson River, and from the Great Lake. There is a huge opportunity for New York on, on both sides of the state to develop offshore wind. And we've seen support in offshore wind um, develop from uh, growing rapidly from businesses and labor, community groups, environmental justice organizations, labor unions, uh, environmental groups, all wanting to see uh, New York State become the national leader in developing this amazing resource. So with that, we will um, pass it to our, our uh, panelists today. Um, the first uh, speaker is uh, needs almost no introduction. Uh, New York State uh, Assembly Member Felix Ortiz retired, um, and we will pass it to Assembly Member Ortiz. Well, I love the word retire. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Felix Ortiz. I am the former uh, Assistant Speaker of the New York State Assembly. I'm very proud to uh, be part of the EOPA, uh, and I'm very happy to uh, I give you some talking of appreciation from New York about uh, what we did when I was in office, uh, when we passed the uh, famous uh, uh, leadership, uh, Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act. And that the purpose of this uh, really was to ensure that we can develop some objective, uh, some mission and some purpose about uh, bringing New York uh, more close uh, to tackle the issue of climate change. Most of, most of us know that uh, uh, Sandy had a big impact uh, in New York uh, City as a whole. Uh, and I will just share a quick example. Uh, I live on 33rd Street between 4th and 5th Avenue, which is a little slope next to the Greenwood Cemetery uh, in Brooklyn, New York, uh, the area called, depending who you're talking to, South Slope, uh, uh, Greenwood Heights, Sunset Park. But the bottom line is whichever name you use, uh, our houses on that block, which is in a little slope, uh, all got water in our basements as a result of Sandy, as a result of what happened September 1st of, of this year, uh, where we have a complete overflow of water uh, in New York City. All those houses got water again due to the fact that we are very close to the Hudson River, uh, First Avenue uh, uh, in, in, in Brooklyn, New York, is very close to it. And I'm very proud to say that um, uh, the, uh, the, the Climate, climate, the climate uh, Leadership and Community Protection Act include frontline communities in the manufacturing, development, and generation of shore wind power. Talking about uh, the generation of, your, of offshore wind power, I'm very proud to say that I was the one who passed the bill uh, to ensure uh, by the way, the bill never passed, but they never, the bill was introduced by me to include, to make uh, that our district will be one, an example of, uh, of, uh, of this uh, uh, offshore wind power and, and, and was part of the budget. And we finally got it. Uh, and unfortunately, that was when I uh, lost my election. And, uh, and the offshore uh, wind power is in the process of being built in the city of New York, right here next to Red Hook. Brooklyn, New York, and, and Sunset Park. So that will be an example of uh, how uh, quickly uh, New York State not only is moving, but need to move uh, in order to catch up with 2040. Uh, just keep in mind as well that to achieve a carbon uh, free power grid by 2040, CLCPA set a mandate 
to have about 9,000 megawatts of shore wind energy by 2035, uh, enough to power the need of about 6 million ho households in New York City. Uh, this, is, uh, this is to ensure the, all the five borough. Uh, the, new, the New York State Energy Research and Development Authority conducted 20 studies and engaged with uh, stakeholders and the public to create the offshore wind master plan to determine the most responsible and cost-effective pathway for developing offshore wind energy. Uh, business uh, is part of that, environmental justice organization, the labor unit that was mentioned before, and community environmental group, which is, should be the most, all want to see the offshore wind develop responsible. And the other thing that we have to talk is about economic development. Uh, you know, this, bring, this create jobs, but we have to also make sure that as we're creating jobs, most of the community that really have been impacted by climate change, and thank you to, uh, to our great uh, uh, in the wheel world of the power broker uh, um, uh, who, who built all this highway that divided the whole city of New York, the BQE, which is uh, when you come through um, uh, uh, Staten Island to Brooklyn or New York City, you know, we have about a total of 55,000 tons of emission that get uh, to the our air, which is, uh, I mentioned, I live between 3rd and 4th, uh, between 4th and 5th Avenue, is, is go across first and second avenue. So you think about having 24 school in nearby. So it is about time that the state of New York, the, the big giant step uh, to uh, not tackle only the offshore wind, but also to tackle emission in minority communities. So as a result of that, when, uh, when you see a lot of the stuff that get developed, uh, whether it's a power plant, whether it's where can we uh, storage the recycling garbage, most of the stuff go to minority community. And we had to say that to that, enough is enough. Uh, as we all know, President Biden has set some goal to achieve next zero emission economy by the 2050. We require an unprecedented expansion of renewable energy to replace fossil fuel that continue to fuel the climate crisis. On the fossil fuel angle, I would like to say also that I, I had introduced a bill uh, to ensure that uh, we will be able to remove any investment uh, to any company that provide that do uh, that deal with fossil fuel, and uh, this is regarding pension fund. Uh, and we was uh, very very I was very grateful uh, before I I left uh, that uh, the controller Dinapoli finally decided to move forward to take some steps. Uh, not a step that I wanted to, but uh, he at least decided to take some step. I give some credit to the baby step that he decided to take because in reality, we need to talk about fossil fuel as well. Uh, we cannot uh, have uh, the state of New York to take the lead on climate change, offshore uh, winds, uh, uh, and everything that we are talking, that uh, we will be talking about today. But the battle line here is that uh, fossil fuel continue uh, to be a big, problem to our uh, to our uh, communities, especially minority and disenfranchised community. Lastly, I would like to say that the National Infrastructure Banking uh, that, uh, that I am a part of the think tank group uh, at the national level, uh, we've been fighting to ensure that uh, we'll be able to include all this uh, element as well uh, into the, uh, back, uh, the, the bill that was passed in Congress uh, which uh, I think, uh, even though it's $1.7 trillion, really is not taking us to uh, the finish line, but at least like people in politics will say, at least we did something. But in reality is sometimes we do something, but sometimes we, we, uh, we, we have to take the advantage of moving to the next level. Uh, are people who really uh, get afraid and get intimidated because of the politics. And sometimes we have to put our people first rather than politics. And I think I'm very proud to be part of this group because this group is a very proactive, very progressive, and uh, and has shown it to me and demonstrated to me that uh, that not only the environment is is important, not only the climate changes uh, need to be addressed, but they also addressing issues that are impacting uh, veterans as well. And as a veteran, I salute you and I thank you. Uh, for allowing me to be with you to part of this family and for giving me the opportunity to continue to ensure that we will 
uh, 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 keep Washington on their toes as well as we will continue to keep the local and the state level on their toes. So thank you very much. May God bless you. Happy holiday to everybody. And I will be on the site. Wonderful. Thank you, Assemblymember Ortiz. I really appreciate your comments and being and for your leadership well in the assembly in passing the Climate Protection and Community Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act, and in your highlights of the the environmental justice uh, impacts of fossil fuels and uh, the consequences of um, you know increased superstorms like Superstorm Sandy, which hit I know hit your district very hard and the benefits of wind to uh, protect those local communities as well as create jobs. And apropos um, on the subject of creating jobs, wind power is something, offshore wind power is something that can create jobs across the entire state, not just along the coast. And I think nowhere, nowhere is that more clear than in the Port of Albany and along the Hudson River. So we go next to um, our co-chair uh, in New York, um, Albany County legislator, William Reinhardt. Uh, Legislator Reinhardt. Yes, um, thank you very much for the opportunity to uh, talk about uh, what I would like to call the, the great energy transition that we're in the middle of. And uh, one of the points I'd like to make here is that um, there is a lot of misinformation out there about the economic impacts of this transition that we're, that we're going through and that we have to go through because of the climate imperative. And um, ever since I uh, had my professional career at the New York State Energy Research and Development Authority, where I saw wind farms helping farmers uh, stay afloat economically as, a, as another stream of income, uh, I, I recognize for many, many years now that the, um, the green economy, as it is called, actually creates more jobs than the, um, the traditional economy, the fossil fuel-based economy. And that's where we have to go. That's where uh, that's where the wind, the offshore wind really will take us, um, as Dominique alluded to, as well as Felix. Um, we have job creation happening all over the state. It will happen all over the state um, as a function of the, of the offshore wind development. And um, other speakers may talk about what's going on in Long Island or what's going on uh, up in the, in the Rochester area on Lake Ontario, Lake Erie. But uh, what I wanted to focus on is in my, my area, I um, represent uh, parts of Albany County, including the town of Bethlehem. And um, the town of Bethlehem has a little bit of property right along the Hudson River uh, next to the Port of Albany. And both the town of Bethlehem and the Port of Albany are going to see hundreds of jobs created um, because of the offshore wind development that is happening um, in our communities. And this will be to uh, assemble the large turbines and um, perhaps manufacturing some of the uh, components, you know, some of the supply chain. And what we are looking at, and, and I should actually say that all over the state, I think this is an issue because of the climate bill that Felix alluded to. We are, um, we are looking at how we can do the best job possible of creating uh, employment in the environmental justice communities as a function of addressing the climate transition that we need to do. And I think offshore wind is a good example of that. And I mean that in two ways. One is the um, creation of jobs for uh, environmental justice community uh, workers or uh, people who are looking for work and where we can provide job training to um, get them ready for that kind of employment. Um, and, and there are things in the works in the capital district to do that. In addition, uh, I wanna make the point that often uh, there is misinformation that is put out that uh, if we kind of go green, if we, if we invest in the green economy, we're gonna be losing all of these fossil fuel jobs. It's gonna be bad for the economy. And um, you know, we just can't, we, can't, we can't afford to do it because of job loss. In fact, the green economy does create more jobs and um, many of the skills that are needed for the offshore wind industry, for example, are skills that are used in the oil and gas uh, industry. As we decarbonize buildings, it's going to be a similar story where uh, plumbers and pipe fitters and, and a, lot of, a lot of union jobs that are now uh, basically providing uh, the fossil fuel infrastructure in, in buildings um, can transition over to 
the new geothermal technologies, the new heat pump technologies for decarbonizing our buildings. So there is a um, there is an important uh, job transition component um, in moving towards the green economy. But the offshore wind is a great example of how we can do that. We are doing that, and uh, I really think it's important for everybody to understand that all of these things are possible. They are doable. Um, we in New York are showing leadership to um, take these, these early steps, uh, but there's a lot more that needs to be done. And I hope that uh, you know, one of my uh, goals as, as part of EOPA is to help uh, not only uh, move New York as quickly as possible, but to help others across the country realize the, the really the golden opportunity that we have here to uh, fix things, uh, protect the planet for our children and grandchildren, and uh, every time I look in their eyes now, I am thinking about what can I do to make a better world for everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Legislator, uh, Legislator Reinhardt, uh, for your comments and really lifting up the, the jobs benefits in, in local communities and the, the individual peoples and lives who can be benefited by, um, by this job creation in local communities, good paying jobs, union jobs that can really lift up entire areas of the state, entire communities, and the economic benefits extending uh, well beyond the coasts um, throughout the state. Uh, next, uh, going to thinking about those underserved communities and communities that are impacted by environmental racism and impacted by um, the impacts of, the, of climate change and really from coast to coast um, and not just uh, again along the, the shoreline on the ocean, but also in the Great Lakes, uh, going next to Rochester Council Member Mary Lupian. Uh, Council Member Lupian. Hello. Um, I am Council Member Mary Lupian from Rochester, New York, and I'm very excited to be here today to talk about offshore wind and what that looks like upstate. It's really exciting that there's so much momentum and investment in wind projects in New York State. We've got five offshore wind projects currently in active development, and these projects will account for 50% of the mandate set by New York's Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act, the CLCPA that was mentioned before. And this goal is, again, to have 9,000 megawatts of offshore wind by 2035. This goal is going to contribute to achieving a non-carbon or a carbon-free power grid by 2040, as well as diversifying the nation's energy supply, increasing our national security by accelerating energy, energy in independence efforts and reducing air pollution and greenhouse gas emissions. However, all of these great projects are in the Atlantic Ocean off of the coast of New York City. Being so far from the coastline, often New York, Western New York hasn't been on the radar when it comes to offshore wind, but there's amazing potential and opportunity to develop offshore wind in the Great Lakes of Ontario and Erie. In fact, according to the Great Lakes Offshore Wind Energy Consortium, the total offshore wind power is over, potential is over 700 gigawatts in the Great Lakes region. That's, that represents one fifth of the total offshore wind potential in the United States. Western New York wind projects have the potential to not just account for the remaining 50%, but to surpass New York's goal of 9,000 megawatts. Combined New York wind projects, both upstate and downstate, have the potential to generate 80% of the electric, electricity demand in the entire United States. And it's important to recognize that we must have a just and responsible implementation of renewable energy. Many of our frontline communities have suffered the negative effects of our current energy infrastructure for decades. New York CLCPA mandates including frontline communities in the manufacturing, development, and generation of offshore wind power and requiring that these underserved communities receive at least 35% of the benefits of renewable energy generation. Rochester is one of those underserved communities. Our city ranks number one in the country for extreme poverty and compared with cities our size, we rank as the number one worst city in the United States for child poverty, with 40%, 48% of our children living under the poverty line. This is not one of the things that you want to be first in. So deployment of offshore wind in Rochester would create thousands of good green union jobs with workers trained in installation, maintenance, and manufacturing. 
Rochester, like many cities, is experiencing, experiencing a housing crisis. A recent housing market study shows that depressed wages were at the heart of this affordability crisis, and the jobs created by offshore wind would immediately benefit our people, giving them the resources they need to increase their quality of life for their families and the entire community. Offshore wind represents an incredible opportunity for Rochester to become a manufacturing hub, shipping turbine blades, towers, and engines all across the Great Lakes. Historically, the cost associated with offshore wind has been a barrier. However, the cost of not investing in offshore wind in the Great Lakes is extremely high. New Yorkers have already been paying the price to the tune of hundreds of billions of dollars because of the extreme weather events due to climate change. And we have paid the cost, not just in dollars, but in lives. Investing all that we can in renewable energy infrastructure and protecting New York from the worst effects of climate change is our moral responsibility. We have to say yes to climate action, and that means saying yes to offshore wind projects. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Lupien, and really appreciate you highlighting the the economic and, and uh, environmental racism aspects of the climate crisis of pollution and the disproportionate benefits that can come to communities that are on the front lines of the climate crisis. And, and thank you again for your all of your leadership um, and, and also the benefits that you highlighted with not, um, not just one Great Lake, but two Great Lakes that uh, New York borders. So it's a huge opportunity, as you've said, to, um, to benefit from, from this development. And uh, making full circle around the state, going back um, to the place that really is, uh, that stands to benefit the most um, from offshore wind and is the, the area where there, a lot of the focus is in the media as well is on Long Island. And so there we go to uh, East Hampton Council Member uh, Sylvia Overby, Council Member Overby. Okay, thank you so much for this opportunity to speak about um, our coastal community. Uh, the town of East Hampton is a registered climate smart community in New York State. We have our bronze certificate and we're very close to getting our silver certificate as we work diligently toward that goal. Um, we are a community of 73 square miles, but we are surrounded by water on three sides. In 2013, we declared our intention to become 100% renewable for electricity consumption by 2020. And by 2030, the town was hoping um, to be 100% uh, for heating, cooling, and transportation by using offsets. Uh, we have missed our goal and our deadline of 2020. And very quickly, we realized that there are not enough rooftops or land that could support solar or land-based wind as a sole source for renewable energy and renewable electricity we realized that offshore wind is the only way the town could meet its goals. Um, East Hampton, as I said, is a coastal community. It feels directly the effects of climate change and sea level rise. As a second homeowner, tourist-based community with farming and fishing as a major contributor to our economic base, we know that the environment is our economy. This is why East Hampton declared a climate emergency in 2020. The town of East Hampton has also developed a plan for retreat from the coastline um, where motels in Montauk were allowed to build on a primary dune uh, when the planning department was abolished for several years in the 1960s and 70s. What we know is that there is no time to waste in transitioning to clean renewable energy and offshore wind gives us that opportunity to reduce our carbon footprint and make a meaningful contribution to reducing the use of fossil fuels. There is not enough land, as I said earlier, for solar or land-based wind um, turbines. And so the town has um, partnered with South Fork Wind Farm. It's a Danish company, Orsted, and a Connecticut-based company, Eversource, um, to give us uh, 12 turbines, 35 miles offshore of Montauk, that will produce 132 megawatts. Um, and this project uh, will help in uh, uh, powering 70,000 homes in our area. Um, in addition, uh, South Fork Wind is also going to build an operations and maintenance facility. Um, it is planned for the Montauk area. This will provide jobs for our local workforce. 
Additionally, the town has also passed legislation enabling community choice aggregation when our local utility allows this program whereby the community can choose renewable sources for electricity. I believe this program will drive the demand for renewables and for offshore wind energy because it could become the largest supplier of renewable energy. Locally, we have a 501c3 organization um, called Win with Wind. Um, it has been educating our local population about offshore wind energy and its enduring supply and what it can do for our community as well. Uh, the town of East Hampton continues to be a leader in clean energy and addressing climate change uh, by supporting South Fork Wind. Um, the construction will begin early next year and hopefully completed by 2023. We know that the time is to act now. And I thank you for this opportunity to discuss it. Thank you, Councilmember Overby, and really appreciate your comments uh, as well as your uh, on the front lines, uh, not only of the development of offshore wind, but also of sea level rise too. And as, as studies have shown, uh, offshore wind farms actually reduce the power of incoming storms, reduce the storm surge and the strengths of the storms. So thank you for your leadership uh, on this issue uh, on behalf of the entire state um, uh, for offshore wind. Great. Um, so with that, I think we will uh, open it up for questions so all the panelists can come back on video and we will open it up for questions from the audience from the media. So I see a uh, first question is this, obviously this is uh, offshore wind is happening nationally. Um, how does development in New York state set the stage for other development of offshore wind uh, across the country? Maybe Assembly Member Ortiz, um, since you, you have been working on this issue at the legislative level for quite a while and have visibility to other states, if, if you might take that question. Well, I think I, I think I think one of the most important thing here is that uh, uh, you know uh, people need to work together from the bottom up uh, and also uh, uh, to ensure that uh, you know we can pass three thousand legislations. Uh, it, uh, it, it doesn't make no sense. Uh, if we don't have a procedures on how to execute and, and, and keep uh, uh, this uh, uh, and the, the executive to execute uh, this, this legislation. I think that uh, the, the critical part here is that uh, people like us, like uh, we are meeting and we're talking about this and we continue to push to make sure that uh, uh, climate change continue to be an, uh, 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 top of the agenda and that we really uh, want to accomplish the mission of 2035 and 2050 uh, to, uh, to guarantee that uh, uh, these guidelines and this uh, purpose and mission that has been developed uh, on this particular piece of legislation uh, get accomplished. Uh, and, and, and local government as well as uh, a state government uh, has to work together with federal government to ensure that we be able to get the financial resources that we need to move forward. Thank you, Assembly Member. Would other folks like to tackle that question? I'll jump in. Uh, what I would like to say, Dominique, is that um, often when it comes to state policy, uh, you have uh, New York and, and uh, California can often lead the way. And uh, they will do things that are innovative. And then, uh, especially, obviously, when they succeed, they get picked up by other communities and other states. I think what's gonna happen on the East Coast is um, all of the Eastern seaboard states are looking at what California, or I'm sorry, what New York is doing. And um, they're gonna to try to take lessons learned from it. And they're gonna to try to develop the same thing. I've, I've seen you know, reports up and down the coast all the way to Florida, where um, these, these things happening in New York state are being observed. And uh, they are looking to see um, what kind of economic benefits a crew. And I think, you know, what you'll see is, is a lot of uh, following on and perhaps even efforts to um, uh, refine and learn from the experience of New York and, um, you know, develop their own, their own wind industry. We, we are setting the template for the rest of the, the Eastern coast and uh, as well as New England. And I think that, um, you know, that's that's kind of the role of states is to be the innovators and to uh, demonstrate how things can can improve. 
And, and that's what I think will happen. Wonderful, thank you, Legislator Reinhardt. Um, and we're seeing another question here. So the offshore wind, as uh, is a panelist mentioned, where 90% of total US energy demand can be met by 2050 with offshore wind can really drive economic development. But how do we explain as elected officials, how do we explain the, the initial investment costs, the transmission projects, and how will that be financed to those that may be skeptical? <laughs> Legislator Reinhardt, I know you are you have uh, decades of experience in clean energy uh, development, if we, if we can put you on the spot. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, <laughs> um, what I would say is that um, Offshore wind compared to a lot of the other renewables like on, on land wind and on land solar, um, it is more expensive. And it, this is, a, I think, a great example of why you need uh, federal and state partnerships to get these things moving. If you look at the history of energy innovation, um, the government always has played a role in developing some of the new technology from its national uh, energy research labs and, and things like this. And you know this is again happening, whether it's new materials being developed um, or, or initial uh, investments in, in early, early projects. Um, DOE has been playing a role, the Federal Department of Energy has been playing a role in wind technology development for years and years. Um, I think what's going to happen is if you go back uh, to the last, gen uh, last century and the hydroelectric uh, projects that the government built in New York State along the St. Lawrence River and then the Tennessee Valley Authority. Uh, these were considered expensive projects when they were built. They are now the cheapest energy we have. And I think that you're gonna see a similar trend where wind power um, already on land is becoming one of the cheapest forms of, of, of electricity. Solar on land is becoming one of the cheapest forms of electricity. And eventually we're gonna be looking at all that wind resource that we develop off the shore lines of, of, of New York and elsewhere, and we we'll say, oh my God, wasn't that a, a godsend that we uh, made those investments years ago, operating costs are very low, fuel costs are zero, and uh, they're gonna turn out to be a great long-term investment. But it's, it takes partnerships. It takes, it takes leadership at the federal level and at the state level and uh, participation at the local community level as was alluded to with some of the earlier comments. And I will, I would like to add uh, uh, to add to that that uh, you know every time uh, uh, that uh, we are working on a piece of legislation uh, is two component into it: purpose and what is the fiscal implication. Uh, and I used to work for the Office of Management and Budget, and um, and listen to you a few minutes ago just pumped to me that you know we cannot have a, le a legislation in place without having the adequate funding uh, attached to it. And where do the funding is gonna come from? Uh, whether uh, it's a partnership with the federal government, whether it is uh, you know, uh, taking a, a, a big shot of money to trying to really uh, articulate and to promote uh, job creation that are going to be the job of tomorrow, uh, but investing today is an investment for tomorrow where tomorrow, uh, like I will say before, will be uh, less expensive. Uh, at the beginning, everything costs money. Uh, everybody go crazy about that. But at the end of the day, uh, once people get trained for the right job, whether they are solar panels, where are fixing the winds, uh, assembling those, uh, those winds uh, in our communities or our state, those are critical elements that will help at the end of the day for us to save money as well and to help the consumer to get on the road to ensure that they have the confidence about government delivering to their, uh, to, to their community. So I, I would like to add um, that I believe the local utilities have to also be involved in this transition and we need to be, um, uh, sure that they embrace this change from fossil fuels to renewable energy and that the local communities demand it. Because when the demand for electricity from renewables is um, put forward, uh, I think that, that we will see the utilities change. Right now, East Hampton is having a hard time 
getting a community choice aggregation uh, legislation for, uh, we, have, we, we have it as um, locally, but we can't uh, employ it until the local utility actually allows it to happen. And that's going to that's going to be a struggle for us. Thank you, everyone, for raising those important issues and, and also highlighting the importance of the federal government in making investments as well as well as getting the utilities uh, on board with this. This really needs to be, as as President Biden says, a whole government approach to make this transition. And I think the federal government can be an important partner in helping make those initial investments to to help offset some of those initial costs which can then can benefit local communities over time um, and apropos uh, a question from from the audience is uh, how do local communities feel about the development of offshore wind and uh, there's a related question uh, which i'll put in there as well which is it often seems like second second home buyers um, particularly in uh, those in coastal communities are against offshore wind more than those that live in the area. Uh, thoughts on that? And, and Councilmember Overby, since, since you're as well. well I yeah, I feel like I'm in that uh, battle right now. Um, second home communities, yeah, they second homeowners feel that they don't want the interruption to their lives as these you know projects are moving forward. Um, interestingly enough, what they say is we're all for renewable energy, we're all for it, just not in my backyard. And so that has been something um, that we have had to deal with. In fact, uh, as we move forward and the first wind farm for uh, the state of New York, South Fork Wind, um, starts its construction, you know, I, I get almost daily pushback from having uh, this cable land within a residential community. It is all underground and it will not be seen um, and it will not affect that, that community, um, I, I believe. And that's why I think it's important for this project to move forward. There is always gonna be pushback because they think it's gonna affect them. Um, what we know is that the fishing industry, which we depend on for many jobs here is being affected by warmer waters and um, fish moving away and different species coming in that are not the species that uh, we've been fishing for over the years. And so we need to make sure that climate change doesn't happen here. And we can do that through, through wind energy. It is the most reliable um, and it is uh, capable of furnishing a lot of energy and uh, a renewable energy for those that want it. I'd also like to jump in here. Um, you know, we have similar uh, issues upstate. Uh, we have a much smaller percentage, I think, on the coastline as compared to the rest of the population of our city. And historically, you know, we've had the same issues around, you know, renewable energy is great, but not in my backyard. Um, we had a project, 2007-2008 uh, timeframe, um, in one of our coast communities where the turbines would have been an inch. They would have been able to see just an inch of the shoreline. Um, and it was defeated. Um, but I think that uh, hearts and minds are changing, that people are understanding more and more the impacts of climate change um, have been affecting them on our uh, shores. There's been a rise in lake levels that have uh, caused a lot of destruction to homes that are uh, right on the lake. And that has been tied directly to climate change, effects from climate change. And so, you know, even, even at the coast, Line, our communities are understanding the impacts of climate change are much greater than the um, you know, potential disruptions to their view of the lake or you know, anything uh, to their properties regarding construction. Um, the other issue that we've had uh, is, is around uh, migratory bird patterns, but that has also been um, really shown to wind does not affect um, negatively birds in, in the Great Lakes. So, um, really there uh, is less and less opposition and more and more support for this project, though it hasn't been on our radar again, like I mentioned um, in past years, but it's starting to get a renewed energy um, again because of the effects of climate change that we're seeing. Wonderful, thank you, council member. Um, other thoughts on that question? And I'm, I'm seeing a related question here. I'll, uh, I'll just, I'll just, I want to add one thing uh, in addition to, to what was just spoken about. The climate change uh, issues are, 
becoming more and more obvious to more and more people. And so uh, I, would, I would perhaps say it this way, uh, an inch on the horizon is not as important as six inches of water on your floor in your kitchen. And in my uh, basement. In your or in your basement. So, <laughs> That's right. You know, so so I think that that, that I, I am an optimist because none of us on this call uh, can't, we all have to be optimists because you know we're taking on some vested interests that are very, very well funded. Um, and they fund a lot of the the not in my backyard or NIMBY activities opposing wind farms and, and offshore wind, on land wind, big solar farms, etc. So um, Yes, I, I am an optimist that now what is finally happening across America, in, at least in large areas of America, if not everywhere, that people are realizing that this climate change problem is real, it's happening now, and we really have to start moving uh, and we have to accelerate our transition. Um, otherwise, everything that we're observing is just gonna get worse and worse and worse. So. Um, it sounds like, you know, why be optimistic about that? But I am. I, I think that once we change our mindset and we really decide we're going to tackle this problem, that America can do it. Wonderful and, and well said. Uh, yes, and, the, and also the uh, difference between an inch on the horizon and eight feet of projected sea level <laughs> rise by 2100. Uh, take your pick. Um, so, I mean, a related question you mentioned, uh, legislator, uh, about fossil fuels and the transition off of fossil fuels. One of the questions here is, uh, what what do we say as as elected officials to fossil fuel workers in this transition from uh, from dirty energy to clean energy, and how can we ensure that the jobs that are created in the green economy are accessible for any workers who are displaced? Uh, one thing one thing I want to mention about that issue is that I've I've seen some literature, some research from various academic sources that say um, many workers in the oil and gas industry, I, I, I'm not sure about coal, uh, it's a little bit different because you're not going to be mining a lot of offshore wind, but um, a lot of the oil and gas workers uh, have stated apparently in surveys that they are interested and would like to have a job in the green economy. They're not sure that it's going to be there for them, but they would like to have it. Now, that's, that's really different from saying, this is the job I have done and I never wanna change. And I, you know, just protect, protect my vested interest in doing this job for the rest of my career. Um, that's a very different thing if in fact they are interested. And so I think the role of government is to make sure that we provide, um, support for that transition, which is some of what the Build Back Better is trying to do. Um, and that's why I think it's so important actually to pass Build Back Better, because that will really enable this transition in many, many ways. Um, but uh, yes, there needs to be some job training in some cases. In other cases, the transition is almost seamless because you're basically doing the same work. You might be doing it on an offshore wind tower instead of on an uh, offshore oil uh, platform, um, but the, a lot of the skills are, are very much uh, translatable. I would like to add to, to that uh, a, couple of, a couple of points because, um, you know, been on the uh, fossil fuel legislation for over 10 years and finally we got to the, we got some commitment from uh, the controller of the state of New York, Tom DiNapoli to, uh, really uh, look into it and to begin to uh, uh, develop a plan of action to remove any investment uh, into fossil fuel industry. Uh, I was the guy who was attacked by everybody uh, from different angles, uh, not to, to, you know, to remove that legislation because uh, that was uh, death in arrival. In arrival. Uh, but I always kept my confidence because uh, William is absolutely right. Uh, is, uh, is when I was talking about uh, the investment of the pension funds uh, 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 fossil fuel uh, for, from the controller's office, my, my other point was uh, to ensure that we have a, a job training program on some kind of, uh, of, of transition in place 
uh, to help these folks who are in this particular industry not to uh, suffer. And uh, and uh, you know, I always I always saw the two sides of the coin because it's uh, you know for every piece of legislation that we put is another side. And uh, and the other thing is that was very interesting uh, that some of the company that uh, one way they will talk to me that they will support the issue and the other ha the other hands will sponsor and fund group to go after me. Uh, so, so yeah, you have these folks coming to my office and one hands and they supporting me off the record, but on the record, they're going after and get the money for the people who have to come after me uh, in different direction. But uh, that transition is critical. I don't believe that uh, what we want to say is people are out of work, out of jobs and, uh, and suffering. Uh, that's not the purpose here. The purpose here is I think we get into a very, uh, and was said before, a, a very interesting dynamic of being more realistic and understanding that uh, climate, climate change really is real. It's happening in places that never happened before. You know, I give you the example of my basement, but that's real. It uh, happened twice and I'm on the slope. I'm not, uh, I'm not uh, down for First Avenue for those of you who probably know my, uh, the city of New York or Brooklyn. And lastly, I would like to say that, uh, you know, the way I was looking into fossil fuel, I was looking to uh, a Kodak in Rochester. When we had it to deal with Kodak in Rochester, uh, had it to the, uh, the, 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 the economic development and the members from Rochester decided to put in place a plan of action of transition, where these workers are going to go. Well, the good news about most of the people uh, that work in Kodak was engineers. So a lot of them transitioned to Rochester uh, uh, University Hospital and some you know, decided to stay there or they got transitioned out to someplace else. But this is people who was, uh, had the skills to transition into something else. And I think that's, uh, that's, uh, that's what I see with the fossil fuel, uh, that uh, we can move those people. Uh, again, uh, William is right. Some of them probably will have to transition deeper <laughs> than others. But at the, at the end of the day, it's about education, 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 and continue to be, uh, uh, to be uh, on, 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 the, on the objective that we need to educate our children from the bottom up that when those, those people become to be the leaders of tomorrow, they will be able to carry on the torch. Well, thank you, Assembly Member. And there's a related question here um, to that point that maybe it's a question for Council Member Overby um, and others that, are, uh, that have these industries in their areas, but opponents of offshore wind have said some of the concerns about the impact, not just of fossil fuel, workers, but on other offshore economic sectors like fishing, shipping, and tourism. What is our plan? Uh, what is the state's plan as, as elected officials to address these communities and these jobs um, at work in these sectors for New Yorkers? So for fishing, um, we, South Fork Wind, Orsted, Eversource has um, committed to putting money into uh, developing a, a, and, and studying what's happening with our fishing uh, population itself so that we know where they're going, what's happening um, to the fish uh, and, and how it can help our fishermen. Um, and they've committed that through our, we have a body also called trustees and those trustees are also um, uh, gonna be very instrumental in helping with the study for uh, what's happening with our fishing industry. Um, we know that from the five turbines that are on Block Island, that they, those five turbines have actually attracted more fish in that area, that fishing is continuing. When uh, the South Fork Wind was working with the fishing, um, uh, putting in the 12 turbines, they needed to make sure that, they, uh, that the turbines were uh, spaced in a way that would allow the fishing boats to go in between. Um, those turbines without uh, uh, a problem. Um, they, at first they were too closely spaced together. So working with the fishing industry is helpful. Having the maintenance and operation facility in Montauk will help some that wanna transition from um, commercial fishing and working on, but still wanna work on boats. They'll be able to work on boats and you know, get jobs through that facility that um, is being planned for the Montauk area. So I, I 
you know, yes, there are obviously problems, but there are more problems with warming waters. And so we need to make sure that climate change, we're seeing it happen even without the wind farm being developed. So we know that the fishing industry is in trouble with, with or without wind farm. Um, you know, so, and, and the wind farm, South Fork Wind is willing to help the best they can with any studies that need to be done and help that needs to be done, particularly with onshore um, uh, fishing, the squid and, and, and different species like that that could be impacted with um, a cable, an underground cable. So, you know, the, but, but we're working through that and South Fork Wind has been very helpful in making sure that the transition happens um, so that the fishermen can still complete their jobs and do their jobs for the community and, and beyond. Wonderful, thank you, council member. Um, so I think that uh, concludes our questions. We have many, uh, many more questions um, <laughs> from disinformation, how we combat that, how power will be transferred across the state, um, how it's uh, opportunity for uh, equitable transition. Um, maybe any last comments from uh, on those questions or others uh, before we close? Well, I, I do think the power grid's important uh, if, as we're transmitting. I mean, this is what we're talking about locally is the transmission cable. The transmission cable is going to come ashore. It's going to then go to a, a substation here in East Hampton, and then it will be, uh, you know, uh, those electrons will be transmitted. <laughs> So, you know, yes, transmission is an important part of this and, and we have to embrace and the utilities have to start embracing um, making that grid stronger uh, so that we'll accept renewable energy. Dominic? Assembly member, you're, you're, on, uh, you're on mute. Uh, we'll go to Legislator Reinhardt. I, I just want to add also on, on the question of, of the utility grid, uh, Sylvia's right. It really is critical that the utilities um, get on board with the transition because for many, many years, they have fought various, various initiatives to change how the grid uh, operates. Uh, the point I want to make is that as we uh, address the climate challenge and as we decarbonize and, and eliminate fossil fuel, both from the generation of electricity, but also for heating and cooling our homes, um, we're going to see the demand for electricity go up, yeah. perhaps significantly. And, and that's why uh, these renewable efforts like offshore wind are so fundamentally important to our transition off of fossil fuels, um, because we are going to need more rooftop solar, we're going to need more on land solar, and on land wind, and we're gonna need the offshore wind. And the offshore wind is a huge potential, much larger than any of the others I cited. So it's really gonna be fundamentally critical for us to address the climate challenge, uh, save our planet. And the last thing I wanna say is change is happening. We are not able to stop change. Climate change is fundamentally changing everything from the fisheries, from the lobster uh, harvests to, um, everything. So, so we have to remember that when we're addressing a challenge, uh, nothing is going to stay exactly the way it has been. It just can't because we're already in this change. The question is what kind of change do we want and where do we want to end up? Thank you, Legislator Reinhardt. I think that's a great summary and a, and a great way to close. Um, and as a, as a reminder, you know, we're here today because 100 elected officials across the state have joined the call to support offshore wind for New York State. The benefits uh, are, are multi, uh, multifold, uh, multifaceted, and from coast to coast across the entire state that New York, perhaps more than any other state, can really benefit because of the uh, immense shoreline and, and areas of the state uh, that, are, that are covered. Um, and as well as that are impacted by, by the, the impacts of uh, the climate emergency that the offshore wind will help mitigate. So we, we thank everyone, you know, elected officials to protect America is, is here as a network of state and local elected officials because we committed to solving the, the climate emergency, um, economic uh, and, and environmental justice and protecting our, our land and waters. And we believe in that elected officials have the power, have the responsibility to care for our communities, to steward our communities, to 
take courage, courageous leadership when crises like the climate crisis come up and that we have collective power by working together in our communities and across our states and across the country to uh, address these challenges. So I wanna thank our, our panelists and our speakers today and our elected officials for your leadership and for taking the time today. Um, and would like to thank our audience and anyone that has any questions, please reach out to our communications team uh, at Ramona at protectingamerica.org.